with you. So how's cool. things? How's things? Good. Yeah. yeah. Just uh, hanging out in Utah. Hanging out in Utah. And, and I say this to all my guests, that the, the way COVID has evolved my podcast to reach out to people all around the world, because I wasn't doing this pre-COVID, you know? I was oh, like, okay. I had an office in Edinburgh, Scotland, and we had a studio through the back, and it was just whenever people sort of came through town. But look at us now. Right. Look at us now. Yeah. I know. Yeah, That's it's great. crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> and how, how's life been for you? Because, I mean, first things first, how's the injury? I mean, we, I followed you for a while, and I'm not a ski guy, okay? I'm not that uh-huh. big mountain guy or anything like that, but you must have lots of followers like that that just are so interested in what you do. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, I mean, skiing's been, like, the central piece of my life, so that's definitely... I think the majority of my following and what people like, and then the kind of fitness exercise stuff has followed um, since then. Yeah. And, and rehabbing at the moment, how's the knee? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So rehabbing a knee at the moment and it's going well, it's uh, it's a long, slow process, but we're getting there. And what was it? You've done the ACL. I'm right in saying PCL as well. You've basically just, you've done everything, but this isn't the first time, is it? No. So I've had, yeah, two previous ACL injuries on my right leg. And then on this one's on my left leg. And yeah, it was ACL, PCL, MCL, meniscus, patellar tendon. So it was like a doozy for sure. Yeah, you, you, did, the, you did the whole thing. Now, I'm from a rugby background. Okay. Okay. I played a lot of rugby and I've done what I've done. I, in one turn, one twist, I once did my PCL, my medial ligament hairline okay. fracture on the kneecap and then bruised bone. So I did a, that was a full oh, nine, nine months off, off the rugby pitch. Yeah. But yeah. When it, in rugby, when you get an injury like that, it's almost a career ender. Now, obviously tech and, and, and medical is, is all sort of kicked on over the years for what you do and how hard skiing is and the adventures you go on, on your knees. It must be a worry. It must be a worry. <laughs> totally. Um, you know, and, I, back in the day, kind of previous to like the blow up of the internet and social media, an ACL was definitely on the verge of a career ending injury for skiers. Yeah. But, you know, like given social media and this like platform to show what you're doing all the time, it created an opportunity for me to, yeah, kind of just like show the rehab process, stay involved with posting skiing and being involved with people and sponsors. And so it kind of like helped grow my platform actually. Um, And, and then, yeah, the, the physical worry of getting back on snow, I won't really know till I'm there and it's gone well previously with injuries. So I'm expecting, expecting a hundred percent recovery on this too. Uh What's so you've done this before. What's it like when you're at the top of one of the peaks and you know, you know, in your head, are are you good mentally? Are you mentally strong to get your body back into that sort of peak performance position where you think I'm here, this is it. Nothing's going to give up. Yeah, totally. It's kind of a, like a symbiosis between like physical training and mental strength where the more physical training I've done and kind of checked all the boxes, so to speak on the rehab it helps the mental state where it's like, I know I put in the time, I put in all the effort that I could to get back to being a hundred percent. So then when I'm up there, you know, I've, I've covered all the bases and the only thing I need to worry about is getting down safely and, you know, skiing it as stylishly as I can. Are you you a follower of the Joe Rogan podcast? Do you listen to Rogan? I haven't, no. I've like a, a few here and there, but... There's a guy that was on recently, he's called, on Instagram, Knees Over Toes. Okay, yep, I've heard of him, yeah. I've heard of him, and he's, he's a knee guy. He rehabs people, he sorts people. He went from, like, he was a basketballer, he couldn't dunk, worked on his knees, he now dunks and all that sort of stuff. He's right. an interesting guy, and not that I've got any kind of medical background, but I've started trying to do a few things as I try to pro- prolong life knees health everything he seems to just specialize and has built a huge business and following over totally helping people's knees it's incredible like you say about social media gone are the days where you go to your physio and that's the only sort of route you can get help with you yeah can re- reach out around the world and get help from people you've never met get tips yeah. hints, and just develop there's tons of folks out there like even stem cell you've got all the stuff over there that 
I mean, so many years ago, we had none of it. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a pretty cool, I mean, I don't know about cool time to be injured, but it's like, there's a lot more information out there for being injured. Yeah. And, and the way you look at it, obviously with you're creating content now, it's a different kind of content and people can follow your journey and you'll be helping other people with techniques. Yeah. And, and when you do have the dark days and the, and the, the rubbish days that you're thinking, oh, when, come on, when will this end? When will this end? Yeah. You can uh, talk to people about it. You can express what you're going through. Totally. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Talk to me about your new buddy, your new, uh, your new dog, Ranger. Oh yeah. He's, uh, is he right there? No, he was a minute ago, but he just went down in the living room. Um, how's that life uh, treating you when you've got a dog, you've got something else to be responsible for. Yeah, totally. <laughs> it's so fun. It's so rewarding, but, uh, cause I've, I've always wanted a dog, but it's like traveling with skiing and being on the road so much, it just wasn't the responsible thing to do. And now that I've been kind of home and I can manage my schedule a bit more, it was, it was time. So it's been super fun. Um, cause we grew up training some of the avalanche dogs around the Wasatch here. Cause they use the ski patrol use dogs to help locate, um, people that have been buried in avalanches. Yeah. So our family was always pretty involved in helping train those puppies and watch the dogs if the home owners were out of town. So I've had like a pretty good background in handling dogs and training them up. So it's fun to have my own. What, what kind of dogs do they use? What breed do they use for avalanche searches? Mostly we like labs, Labradors. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Um, Cause there's a lot like a, quite a bit of the training is similar to like a gun dog training or a hunting dog and developing their smell and you know you're just taking what the dog knows how to do naturally and you're just kind of shaping it to what you want it to do so is it gone of the days do you remember the images of like big saint bernards would just yeah. head off into the mountains with like a, a barrel of whiskey or a drink yeah. of jack, jack daniels around their neck to, if they find someone that i want so it's not like that that yeah. vision that i had's gone that doesn't yeah happen. it's not it's a different than that it's different um, so you've got absolute athlete dogs now heading out there. They're all trained totally. Up. All, yeah. All, and I, bet, I, I bet they've got suits on with kit and supplies and stuff, have they? No, they just have like a vest that kind of, that shows they're allowed to be in the mountains. And sometimes they'll wear like an avalanche transceiver if okay. they need to. Um, but yeah, and uh, different places use different dogs too. Like, um, some have preferences, some don't. And around the Wasatch, we preferred labs, um, but people will use all kinds of breeds. Okay. And what about um, in your dog? Obviously, I mean, we're going to get into your childhood. I know everyone asks you about that, but it's because it's so interesting and, and <laughs> extreme. But I can imagine your dog's going to be up the back of these mountains with you. It's going to be, he's going to be all in. Everywhere yeah. you go, if there's a chance to take him, he's coming with. Is that right? Oh, for sure. 100%. Yeah. Yeah, once we wrap up, we're going to head out to the desert and go for a nice long hike this afternoon. So, Has he got his own Instagram page yet? Is he a celebrity yet? No. <laughs> no. There'll be sponsors. There'll be all sorts coming in from soon. <laughs> you know I, I can hardly manage my own self, though. I don't know how I could manage a dog that looks as good as he does. Yeah, he's a, he's a handsome devil. Um, mm -hmm. How have how, how his life... I was going to say, did you, could you have predicted or could your parents predicted how you would end up now? And you and your sister, obviously, with what you've achieved and the, the way I follow you both from sort of looking into this world that you're in. Right. Did your parents, yeah. so they mapped out a lot of what you were doing, but to get to where you are now, and I can see the Red Bull stuff in the background, the sponsors, the North Face, everything that you do and you've accomplished, are, are you on track? Is everything going to plan? I get, I mean... There was no plan really, but so I've, I've definitely like exceeded my expectations from when I, you know, was younger and thought about my future. It's like, I had no idea any of this was possible. Yeah. Um, cause yeah, I, I got into it and it was just my passion. I just liked to ski and I just took advantage of every opportunity I could and, you know, tried to work as hard as I could for companies that were supporting me and it just kind of grew and grew and grew. And then now, yeah, I'm like 12 years deep into skiing and like 
wow, I can't believe it's still real. Yeah, well, and that's something, and I heard you say on another interview, and it's like your personal brand, you developed, you developed a personal brand around your lifestyle to sort of keep you, where so many people, and you have had friends that you competed with that when you were racing younger and all these sorts of things that do now work in offices, that, yeah. didn't, that didn't make it, you know, didn't, they didn't pass the, that race or they didn't get that medal, they didn't get the sponsorship, and now they're just working hard in maybe worlds and jobs that they don't enjoy. Yeah. You know, what do you think differentiated you? Was it training? Was it mindset? Was it your parents pushing you? What do you think got you to sort of stay on track and live the life that you wanted? Um, I don't know. It's a hard one to put a finger on, but I think I, for me, I, I think it's a lot of personality personally, and it's just how you present yourself. And cause it's like, I, I, I know I'm not the best skier, you know, in any circumstance, there's so many people better than me, but it's just how I started working with sponsors, you know, and it's like the team managers, the people working for companies liked having me around. They liked who I was and what I represented and, you know, and year round. So it's like, I, not only did I ski, but I enjoyed being outside and living this kind of active lifestyle year round. And so I think that helped as well, um, where instead of just a seasonal athlete, it was more or less, I was kind of showing the lifestyle year round. And I think that probably helped a bit too. So yeah, making yourself quite marketable that you can mm -hmm. sort of do one thing and you can only be used or, or they can only benefit from you then you're, you're available all year. Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. And, and what about, and, and you're in Utah at the moment. Am I right in saying, are you familiar with the Iron Cowboy, James Lawrence? I know the name, the Iron Cowboy, but... Yeah, he's the triathlete that did sort of 100 Ironmans in 100 days. Oh, okay, I'm yeah. Sure he, I'm sure he's in your vicinity because Utah, where you live, there's so much going on there, isn't there? You've got the desert, yeah. you've, got, you've got everything. What's, what's that lifestyle like living in Utah? Because it's, it comes up a lot with a lot of my guests. Right. I mean, it's, it's horrible. Don't come here. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, no, it's awesome. It's, it's, it's like, it's pretty unique to have such a big city in such close proximity to so many different things like the mountains, the desert, all these places that offer so many sports, you know, we got like climbing, running, biking, road, biking, skiing, just all across the map. Plus, you know, the international airports a half hour away, yeah. um, which is pretty uncommon. It's like a lot of places that offer the same activities are a lot more difficult to get to. Mm -hmm. and, and you're so in, in sort of deep in extreme sports. Are you familiar or do you follow any of the sort of the, what would you call them, the national sports, the Utah Jazz? Have you got an American football team that you follow in the NFL? <laughs> what are you like on those sports? Or are you just 100% extreme? <laughs> Yeah, those are way over my head. Now, I've I've gotten into them a bit. You know, I just, I find all sports pretty interesting and in just how people can develop certain skill sets to get to the top. So I love watching all sports, but I'm not like an avid fan of a certain sports team. Get off that mountain and go crazy for the Super Bowl. Yeah, totally. <laughs> like, I like watching the Super Bowl, but not, not you. Not for you. Yeah, not like, yeah, I'm not painting my face and stuff. And, and what about obviously Red Bull as a sponsor? I, I've, I've spoken to Red Bull athletes before. Have you been to Grand Prix? Have you had benefited of actually going to other events where you thought, I didn't know much about this and that was incredible? I've been to a bunch of cool, I've never been to a Grand Prix or anything, which I'd like to. It'd be pretty cool to go, yeah, like Grand Prix or F1 or something. Um, but I've been, they brought me down to Red Bull Rampage a few times. What's that that's one? The, it's a mountain bike event. Oh, okay. And so that's really cool. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty into mountain biking myself, but to see the level those guys are doing it like in person is mind blowing. It's like, it's this funny thing where you see videos and it looks wild and extreme, but then when you see it in person, it's a hundred times gnarlier. Yeah. But I mean, what you do going off the side of these cliffs is there is there times that you think uh, i might have pushed it 
maybe I shouldn't do this one. Have you ever been on the edge of the cliff about to go and a cameraman or someone shouts, let's go, we're ready, we're ready, the helicopter's all primed, it's all go, <laughs> and you think, oh, shit. Has <laughs> that ever come in your mind or are you just all in every time? Not, like, once I've been, like, ready to go and the cameras are ready, it's pretty, you know, I've done my assessment, I've thought about it all long and hard and I'm ready to go. Yeah. So I, I try and choose terrain to ski that I'm like on the edge you know it's like a lot of times I like to be comfortable know I can do it and then sometimes it is like you need to push it and you have to go outside your comfort zone but it's still within boundaries it's not like there's all there's always the nerves and the fear kind of keeping you in check yeah. but I've never yeah I've never had to pull out, never pull that pull out and be like I'm out. I can't do good news too much. It's like, I've done that before, you know, when we're, yeah. we're choosing lines and I'm like, that one looks really cool. And then we've done like a flyby in the heli or looked at it through binoculars. And then it's like, no, that's, that's too much. I can't bite that off right now. Uh -huh. And what, see, you see your, your recent fall for the, for the injury. There's that video on your Instagram and obviously your mom and your family are talking. Yeah, you will have had a lot of tumbles in in your career, but do you remember that tumble? Do you remember? Is it so fast that you don't know what's happening and you you end up stopping and then you regain? Um, do you remember any thoughts as it was happening or just as it was about to For happen? For sure, it actually feels like slow motion. Like I remember it so vividly that once I actually saw the video, it was kind of nice to pair up what it looked like from the outside versus what it felt like from my point of view. And what's your first action? Obviously you think it's going slow motion, but it's going so fast. Do yeah. You, do you try and go limp? Do you tense up? Do you, have you got techniques or is it just too fast to react? Pretty tense. So it was like, I, it all kind of went really fast out of control um, as you can see. And then w with the first big impact, I felt something in my knee go out. And I knew I still had enough speed where I was going to be tumbling. So I tried to like crunch up in a ball and hold on to my leg because I didn't want more damage to happen. But what ended up happening was I grabbed above my knee, like grabbed my femur. So I was tucked up in a ball, but then I could feel my lower leg just sort of like windshield wipering around. Ooh. And it was like, as I was falling, I was like, oh, this is bad. And I like, I wanted to get my hands around my lower leg but if I would have let go from my femur I would have just like opened up and done like a big yeah I'm scarecrow cartwheels and yeah all sorts yeah so I just tried to keep it tight and hold, hold as tight as I could so like no other appendages would get hurt what was the rescue like for that how, how long were you on the mountain and did people get you? it was so fast that's where you know it was definitely a silver lining where normally I'm out in deep in Alaska or super far away from civilization. But luckily that was at a ski resort, you know, so the ski patrol were there within two or three minutes, um, helping me out and, and giving me support. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a fair old fall, you know, it's a fair, and what was that for? Was that, were you making a movie? Was that just, uh, it was, what was that for? it was a contest. It was called Red Bull Raid. Okay. It's kind of a unique new, contest format where you'll hike up the mountain and you get timed and then you'll be judged on your skiing back down as well mm -hmm. um and so red bull asked me to come out it's kind of a local event where it's it was mostly people from the area like all super good skiers and they just brought me in to for fun and uh then it was just an unfortunate crash yeah prior to that i mean we talked we touched on your fitness and we'll jump around a few things but obviously you are and it's, you, you laugh. I first discovered you because I kept getting your advert. You know, you oh, know, really? Yeah. And I, and I didn't mind it because every time I was like, oh, okay, I can benefit from this. I like the fitness that you're doing. You oh, know? cool. So I don't think, I mean, what you do, obviously, it works for you and your world and skiing and up the mountains. But hey, I'm a dad of three. I like to stay active. There's things that I can take from that and I can see all the things you're doing. But then when I see you jumping off cliffs, it's like, yeah, follow that. That's, that's interesting <laughs> to watch. Right. But it's, it's something that, um, with your fitness, would you say that all year round you're ready? Like, say Red Bull phone you or say we need you next week. Good to go. 
good to go. I'm yeah. ready. You're constantly staying ready for the next one. Obviously, big dates, they'll be planned and you maybe get your training in for those. But if something comes up, you're ready, constantly on the go. Yeah, totally. I mean, like right now, no, but previously, yeah, it's like a normal year. I'm on the road like 250, 300 days a year. So you're ready. Yeah. So you must find places. You must need a gym everywhere you go. Or do you do a lot of outdoor stuff? Do you find yourself just sort of body well, weight exercises when you need to? Yeah. So mostly I'll do like when I'm skiing full on, I don't do a ton in the gym. It's mostly like maintenance stuff, like keeping core and hips kind of mobile and strong. And anything more than that is just if we're having like a down day where we're not skiing and you just have to burn off some steam or something. Um, but usually when we're on the go, it's kind of like the skiing is enough of a drain on your body that I'm not looking to, I'm not looking to like build muscle or anything during the season. It's just kind of trying to maintain it and, and not lose any strength throughout the season. And that's, what's your off season? What does your off season look like? Will you try and bulk a little bit then? Because you know you'll probably drop weight throughout the season from constant um, adventures? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, as much as I can, I will. But in the off season, I'm doing a lot of normally like running, rock climbing, biking. So I, I stay pretty even throughout the year. Um, and then I in the fall is when I would traditionally start like a heavier strength training program to kind of like really get set up for success for the winter to start and to tell me that every now and again you, you like smash a chocolate cake or or you let go eat the popcorn the cho you know or oh for diet. sure yeah you do thank god because obviously you mean you look after yourself you know you put the videos out there you're in good neck good shape but it's, it's always nice. I always ask the athletes that. It's like, tell me that you have the cheat days and tell me that you, you do pick out every now and again. <laughs> For sure. Because, I mean, I think, like, probably the biggest thing for me in the fitness and in the nutrition sense is just consistency. So I'm not doing, like, huge, crazy ups and downs. It's like I'm trying to stay consistent where, like you said, I could feel like I'm ready to go at any moment and – and feel good about it. And so it's the same with the food. It's, you know, I nine, 90% of the time, it's like pretty dialed and enjoyable to eat. But then there is like, yeah, if I want to have a piece of cake or a bowl of ice cream, cool. I'm not going to feel bad about it. Yeah, good. That's good to hear. Now, we, we touched on, when, again, your, your parents and your childhood and things like that. I've got three kids, you know, and you kind of, I look at fatherhood as it, what can I do? to help my kids and sort of propel them as much as possible. And a lot of it's come through my podcast and meeting interesting people and being able to travel and meet people and showing my kids, look, you can be the strongest man in the world. And right. you, can, you can meet him in Scotland and you can go and see him and you can do these things. Whereas me and my world, away from all podcasting and media, I, I, I mean, real, you'd call it real estate, you know, yeah. rentals, sales and all that sort of stuff. And I've really found myself in a pretty traditional world. Mm -hmm. working hard coming home sitting in traffic listening to podcasts and all these sorts of things i do that i'm guilty of it but my god try to push try to push back try to get yeah. out of it and i'm trying to raise my children in a way that they know they don't have to just go conventional yeah they don't have to follow and do what other people are going to do it's okay you yeah want a, you want to be a skier go and do it find yeah. your way find your path now your parents put you in a position and your sister yeah to go down that route take us back because a lot of my listeners being uk based maybe aren't that familiar with your story of, okay cool of how extreme it was as, yeah as children to sort of live the life that you live totally um yeah i would say the biggest thing is yeah our parents just tried to spend as much time with us as they could and make our lives rich with experience um of being outside and being in nature so you know it was they never worried too much about making money or what um yeah they, they were never like striving to to reach a certain wealth status it was always just about making sure that we had time to spend together outside so so my dad was a ski patrol 
at Snowbird here in the Wasatch, um, which, you know, it's that's not, you're not making a killing doing that. Um, but it was seasonal, so it afforded us the lifestyle where he had the summers off and we took the summers to go live out of a van that he retrofitted um, to be kind of like a camper. So it was just a classic Ford van. It wasn't these crazy sprinter like campers that they have. It, it was just your classic van by the river that he built out to to live in. And so we would just travel around the Western US. They'd pick us up on the last day of school. We'd drive in the van, camp all summer and basically drop us off back at school um, at the end of the summer. So so it was, it was amazing. It was super unique um, in like so many ways, but it was just them providing us with being in nature all the time. And then all the little lessons that you learn from that, like navigating the mountains, how to cook, what kind of food you bring, what layers, like just all these little things that, that all add up to being like proficient in being outside, I guess. And what, what was it like? What was life like when that, when it wasn't the summer, when your dad was working, you obviously had a home, were you, were you surrounded by tons of toys? Was, was life busy like that? Or was it still kind of living minimalistic life and, and have your friends and things at school? Or I'm already seeing you were homeschooled as well. Yep. Yeah, so we were homeschooled um, in the winter months because because we lived up at the ski area, the canyon road got so dangerous to drive, you know, because there's like avalanches hitting the road quite often back in the day. So my parents made the decision to homeschool us from like, I think it was October to March or something. And the rest of the time we were in public school. So I never had any real friends in public school that I stayed close with. Um, but my mom homeschooled my sister, me, and four other employees, kids up the canyon um, until we were 13 or 14. Um, so quite a long time. And and yeah, the, the life it looked, I mean, it was different from most people's because we lived in the employee housing. So it was like a, a pretty tiny one bedroom apartment that we all shared. And my dad built bunk beds in the closet for my sister and I. Um, and then, you know, when we were younger, we had toys like Nerf guns and little GI Joes and stuff. But as we got older, it was just all about spending time outside. So I would just be running around in the woods, you know, like dressed up like a mountain man or Davy Crockett. And I just like love being outside. So they gave us that opportunity. And obviously skiing from a young age, but when did you start competing? And, and then as we roll this, your story on, when did, I'm going to say, is it Willie, your dad's friend? When did Willie mm -hmm. come, in, come into your world and just sort of up the ante? Yeah, totally. He upped it big. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I started ski racing when I was 10. So I was an alpine ski racer from when I was 10 to 15. And, but I, I just, I didn't like it that much. Like just going around the gates and training all the time, all the little details that went into it. But what I did like was having a group of friends that were good skiers and the travel, because we would get to travel to other ski resorts that were super fun. And, um, but once I was 15, my dad realized that I wasn't that into ski racing. And he, he saw that I really liked the free skiing and introduced me to the free skiing team. So I started competing in like the big mountain circuit when I was six, 15, 16. And and then because of that they the free ski team didn't have a ton of structure in the summer versus like ski racing they're 100 percent kind of all the time once you're at a high level yeah. but the free skiing was open in the summer so i ended up just you know i was like love skateboarding so i was just hanging out at skate parks the, gone were the days of living out of the van um, cause my sister was ski racing at such a high level that my dad had to start working year round to support that. Um, 
so I had a lot of free time on my hands and my dad didn't really like what I was doing with it. So he put his foot down, like cut all my hair off, threw away all my clothes and introduced me to Willie uh -huh. Benegas, who was, is a world renowned alpinist. Um, and he also ski patrolled for Snowbird. So that was the connection there. So he just, he took me under his wing when I was 16 and we just started like running, climbing, hiking, kind of just everything I'd done as a kid. But now like you're saying he upped the ante and like the first time we went out, we did what's called the Whirl, which is the Wasatch Ultimate Ridge Link Up, which is a pretty big feat. I, I'm going to blow the numbers if I try and say how many miles and how much vert, but it's like a really big day. And he was like, yeah, we should just go do it. And I had no idea. So I was like, yeah, let's do it. And, you know, we failed miserably, but had this awesome day. And, and that kind of sparked it because he could see that I could move really well in rough terrain. So he's like, all right, this kid's got it. And, and we just started doing all kinds of stuff. So, but yeah, there's all kinds of stuff like hills and local runs. But when did the Seven Summits come onto your radar and be like, yeah, let's, let's go break some records. Let's go and get up Everest. <laughs> Let's go and get up Everest yeah. and let's go and do the other ones. It's 17 years old, is that right? It was, yeah, at 17. Um, so, yeah, when I was 16, I was hanging out with Willie and he had been up Everest multiple times at that point, you know, like seven or eight times or something. So being at his house, it was like you're in an alpinist den, you know, there's like prayer flags, photos of all these climbs they've done all these cool trinkets from around the world. So I was like, man, you like, this is all from climbing and being a pro climber. And he was like, yeah. And so we came up with the idea to do Everest. That was the first goal because it was like, he'd done it a bunch. He knew how to, how it went. And he was like, you totally could climb Everest. Like you're physically capable of climbing Everest. But at, six, so, at 16 years old, what did you know about Everest? How familiar were you with, with it and the danger? And Not not a ton, I would say. It, I mean, as a kid growing up, it was, and we were camped out all the time. If When we were in our little tent, if a storm hit, I would always be like, you know, a seven-year-old. And I'm like, oh, Mount Everest is like, must be so much gnarlier than this. Like, if people can climb Everest, I can get through this, you know? And because it was all, it always just seemed kind of like the pinnacle, like, yeah. Everest is the big one. Um, so that's just how in my head it was just that was the pinnacle of mountains was Everest. And um, and then, yeah, once I was 16 and Willie was like, you're physically capable. It was the biggest hurdle was financial. Right. It's, it's quite a big investment. And hey, with my hey dad, dad being. Hey, dad. Um... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can you sort hey. the plates <laughs> yeah so i have this idea no but it, it was like a, a three-way idea it was willie me and dad um with if anything it was maybe more of dad's idea of him listening to willie talk about me and and he was like we need to get john up everest if that's what he wants to do can, can, I, ask, and, can, I, jump, can I jump in there we yeah. talked about earlier about sort of turning like personal brand do you, do you think your dad was thinking like because because people do things that will help them for the rest of their lives yeah you know your story's so interesting do you think your dad sort of saw that in the future that if he does this at such a young age this will stay with him this is an achievement people will want to speak to him forever about these things i you think he was i don't that far think ahead? i don't think he was thinking that far ahead in terms of a lifestyle he was thinking that far ahead in terms of experiences, right? He's, he was looking at me as a 17 year old and saying like, what experience can we give John before he goes to college, before he starts his adult life? What could he live with forever that he'll always remember? Where most and, parents, most parents are sort of like, you better get a job in a coffee shop. You, you need to bring yeah. in some money. You need to go and, you know, go and lift those hay bales at the local yeah. farm, pick yeah. the eggs up from the chicken you know, and get some pocket money. Yeah. Your no. dad's like, yeah. he was like, as long as we had a goal. So the goal was Everest. And like, as long as we had a goal, he would do anything he could to support that goal. Wow. And, uh, 
and give us that experience. And and then he was thinking the reason we did it I, when I was 17 was because it was at the time I would have been the youngest. So it was a bit of a marketing ploy to raise some funding. Um, so yeah, the idea was to be like, all right, I'm going to be the youngest. So then people might want to like donate to the cause, so to speak, um, which they did the community around here. Uh, lots of brands did, you know, not a ton, but like so many people came out to help fundraise this trip to Everest and it was super unique and but it's like yeah i don't think my dad ever saw it as that it would set me up for life as yeah. a career or a lifestyle whatever it might be and that at the time you were you were the youngest person to get to the summit of everest at the time i was yeah i was the youngest westerner i okay. believe a sherpa girl had climbed it that was younger than me okay and obviously is that being beaten now is there younger people going on yeah there? I think it got beat like the next year. Um, Jordan Romero did it. Yeah. 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 So it didn't last long, but it didn't that, last long. What was that experience like? Was it a couple of months on the mountain acclimatizing and things like that? Yeah. When you actually yeah. got into it, what was it like for you? What were your memories? It was, it was awesome. So yeah, it was the second. So first, before we did Everest, we kind of, we came up with the idea in like September, October. But the big hurdle was like, I've never been to altitude. So we decided to do Aconcagua first down in South America, just to kind of have like an altitude test run, so to speak. And it went super well, like it was a great experience. And uh, so we checked that box, decided to commit to Everest. And at this point, Everest was still the main goal. There was no thought yet of the seven summits. And then when, when we were hiking in to base camp, we were doing some email correspondence between my dad and us. And we brought it up that like, if we summed at Everest, it would be two of the seven summits. So like, what if we committed to all seven? Um, and he it, agreed. His, yeah. What was his reply? Yeah. Oh, hundred percent. He Let's was like, <laughs> yeah, like within 10 minutes, he was probably looking at, Russian visas and flights to Denali, like, because there was so many logistics yeah. that had to happen in a year. Um, so anyway, so we were like, all right, we should do the seven summits. And, and then we refocused on Everest. And it was, it was super cool because at first, I think I did what a lot of people do when they go to Everest or a new place. It was like, I'd forgotten everything I know about climbing because I was at Everest. It was like, Willie was like, all right, we need to cross these ladders, like teaching me some like expedition style techniques of like jumaring the rope and bringing gear up the mountain. And, and it was like, I was frozen. And then this one day, I just kind of had this breakthrough where it was like, I've been doing this my whole life. This is just a longer walk with some steeper parts to it with less oxygen. But other than that, it's the same thing I've been doing my whole life. And once I flipped that switch, it was like, I don't want to say easy because there was obviously still difficulties, but it was like the, it just wasn't scary anymore. What was your summit day like? What was that? Like was the there summit? Was there cues going up at the time? Remember, have you oh seen, yeah. Have you seen that Huge. picture, that famous picture that Nims purged you to? Yeah. I mean, that's gnarly. That's like, pretty wild but it there was definitely still long lines so I'm sure you've heard but like we had a summit window of four days I think between when the jet stream shut off over the summit and the monsoon was supposed to come in okay. you know and it can range from like one day to three weeks it just depends and our our year it was like four days I think and so with that being the case, it's like all the teams at base camp have to get together, come up with a plan so that it's not a thousand people every day or whatever. So we're like, okay, these are the teams going up on day one. These are the teams going day two, et cetera. And so we were slotted for day two. Um, but then the teams on day one couldn't summit because the winds were still too high. So we ended up having 
double the amount of people on our summit day, mm -hmm. which made for some long lines. And overall, it was just surreal. It was, it's like, we got to the South Coal in the afternoon, s set up a tent and tried to sleep and hydrate as much as we could for a couple hours. And then our plan was to leave the South Coal at nine o'clock PM to be the first ones on the rope. And whatever reason, we just, we didn't get out of the tent until like 945. So that, we, that put us well behind a lot of other people. And then it was just like this slow, slow march all through the night, just like one step at a time, cruising and stuck in the line. So at one point, just below the balcony on the triangle face, I was freezing. I was like, and I, so at this, on Everest, I was with Willie's brother, Damien, who is their twin brothers. They're like as twins as twins could get. So, um, I was with Damien and I was like, dude, we might have to turn around. Like I'm going to start losing toes here if we don't move. Cause we were just stopped for like yeah. 20 minutes at a time. So Damien was like, all right, we're going to go. So we just got out from the line and started breaking our own trail next to all the climbers. So of course people were pretty pissed off. We were passing them, but we were having to break our own trail. So it was like, pretty exhausting yeah. um but it did keep me warm and uh got the blood flowing so once we hit the balcony um things were a lot better i was like warmer we were moving at a better pace and from there it was just kind of bumping all the way to the summit which we hit at about eight in the morning so it was like 11 ish hours of just walking up the hill um yeah and obviously we all see the the queues going up to the top and to the summit is it the same on the way down is it just as hard just obviously just as long as anything speed up because i don't think you did it on everest but you're quite partial to skiing down off these huge summits aren't you yeah totally yeah and <laughs> that's why i mean everest i would say everest was the one of the defining moments where it was i knew i wanted to be a skier because i knew like going through all these adventures it was like oh i could be a mountain guide like this is a fun lifestyle uh -huh. but walking down everest it was like i don't want to walk down this stuff like i want to ski down this yeah and uh yes yeah, so it, it can take forever like waiting for people to pass to get back on the rope and how you can pass people safely on these above exposure and because you want to be going fast but you also have to respect everyone else's safety um yeah. and just because i'm like you're an able-bodied person and you're comfortable and everyone else is uncomfortable it doesn't give you the right to just you know make it dangerous for everyone else no absolutely and, and then how did things evolve to get the rest of the summits was that quite a straightforward process obviously visas and everything but that you just took care of that and were you the youngest at the time to to do the seven summits as well as everest yeah yeah, yeah. Oh. Yep. So Everest, yep. I was the youngest Westerner to summit Everest. And then the same was for the goal of the seven summits. I was going to be the youngest. And, um, and yeah, so it was, I mean, for me, it was pretty straightforward. I was just doing, but my parents were the ones that were booking tickets and, you know, and they'd like, my dad still has a flip phone. He's not like a technology guy. So I don't know how they managed to do all the logistics for the seven summits, but they did. And it's like, it's pretty amazing. So they had it all set up. They, I came home for two weeks after Everest and then went up to Denali. Then once me and Damien were on Denali, we had to ship his passport to Russia to get his visa for Russia. So the whole time we were on the mountain, we were like, oh, is his passport going to be back in Talkeetna when we get there? Because he couldn't, he had no other ID, so he couldn't fly anywhere without it. Um, so there's all kinds of these little things that if it would have messed up, we it would have shut the whole thing down. But we had like great weather, logistically, everything worked out perfectly. Because um, we had like just three or four days in between a lot of the trips to like 
come home, reshuffle, get back out there. So it was pretty amazing. It all lined up and we were able to do it. And at what point was it, was it doing things like the seven summit that like the North face got involved and the big sponsorships came in? Was, was that all pretty quick or did you have to go into sort of different adventures and, and show other qualities to get them on board? Yeah, it was, we tried to get some big sponsors on board. Um, but, and so at the time it was Willie and Damien were alpinists for the North face. So we had the in and they North face wasn't into it mm-hmm. at all. Um, which at the time was devastating, but I'm so grateful that they didn't support it because their reasoning was they didn't want to support anyone under 18 because you could change your mind. You know, you're so young, your interests can change. So they didn't want to hire me on as an alpinist at 17. And then once I turned 18, maybe I wasn't into it, which is basically exactly what happened. Um, So it was, once we finished the seven summits, it was, I started free skiing again and competing. And this same year I finished the seven summits, I won like the junior world title. Um, And then that set me up really well to go to sponsors, to be like, all right, I'm going to be a skier. Plus I had that mountaineering in my back pocket. So I wasn't only a contest skier, I could also go on ski mountaineering expeditions. I had experience in these bigger mountains. So even though it was young, I kind of had this diverse skiing portfolio that uh, set me up really well. Absolutely. And see, see when you look at what you've done and you've achieved, when you look at other people, like say Alex Honnold and you look at Nims Berger. Yeah. Have you met either of them? Have you been in the sort of, in the same room, had a chance to chat to these people that achieve extreme exceptional things like you do yeah a ton like yeah i've met like a ton of people like that that are so inspiring and so achieved and pretty much every single one is like so humble just wants to hear about you they don't want to talk about themselves it's like so many of them are so alike in that way um which so i've never met nims but i'd really like to he's like over the past few years he's blown me away multiple times and so i'd love to meet him but gotten to meet like han old and jimmy chin and a lot of those legendary mountaineers jimmy chin i, I watched Climbers. his um the rescue did you see the thai football team that got stuck in i haven't i haven't seen that one yet it's, it's worth it's worth a watch I was, yeah I was listening, he was on a, he was on the yeti podcast you know uh, yeti they, mm-hmm. they did a podcast a while ago and he was on that i was listening to that podcast oh cool he's such an interesting guy jimmy chin obviously yeah. in, in the way that he, he captured um free solo I yeah lo- i love the way how they had to just eventually sort of just set up and wait for the day that alex would go out and, and do it yeah you know? And then yeah. like, we're go, let's go, go, go. And then he's hanging off, yeah. he's hanging off the, the face, just like, uh, it's like the craziest cameraman you've ever seen in your life. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I remember when they were filming that we had a North Face athlete summit and Jimmy came to it and he was like in the middle of it. So he was mind blown. Like he was, we were around the campfires one night. He was trying to describe this one move Alex was doing. And it's like, you could tell his mind was blown at the time at what Alex was doing. And so it makes it even more real when you're like, Jimmy Chin's mind is blown about what Alex is doing. And we didn't really know what Alex was doing at the time. Cause it was still kind of, they're trying to keep it under wraps, but uh, it was like, Oh my God, if he's this like mind blown about it, it must be pretty wild. Incredible, incredible documentary, yeah. incredible achievements. But no, it's, it's so cool just to, to have you on the show. And like I said, right at the start, to be able to reach out on Instagram and say, okay, I'm a fan. This is my yeah. show. This this is who's been on the show. You fancy a chat? Yeah, we, so we cool. Do it. We do it. So I, I really appreciate your time. I know there's so much more we could talk, but I promise you we'd do sort of 45 minutes and we've gone way yeah. past that already. Is it already? Yeah. Yeah, it's up. We're done. It is. We're, we're done. I've, I've, I've taken yeah. your time, and, but you've told your story. And it's, it's to me, it's so interesting. And I love reaching out to people that I'm not that familiar with. And I don't know much about yeah. your sport. But to hear about your fitness and to watch what you do and to hear how you're recovering from surgery and the people you've met along the way. But what I'll really take from this is, is as I say, I'm a father. And the way your dad yep. just sort of 
knew what you, if you guys wanted to do something, he, you and your, him and your mum would do whatever yeah. it took, would do whatever it took to set you guys on a path. And it's, it's inspiring. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. My parents, that's where I feel like I can barely take credit for anything I've done because my parents have been, you know, right here the whole time. So they're like, they're the real winners for sure. It's amazing. Well, here, thank you. Thank you again for, for taking the time for joining me. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. It has been super fun.